Hello and welcome to the EMC Live webinar, Simulators for SI, PI, EMC can minimize and eliminate design iterations and justifying their high cost is easy. My name is Belinda Stasiukevich and I'm the editor of Interference Technology, the creator of EMC Live. EMC Live Design Bootcamp is a new online one-day event hosted by Interference Technology. Featuring practical information and topics, this event featured roundtables, webinars, and videos on everything EMC design related, and there's no cost to attend. If you missed any of our webinars earlier, you can go on our website, emclive2015.com. Our test boot camp will take place this year on November 12th, and our three-day event will take place April 28th to 30th. This webinar is presented by Keith Armstrong. Keith graduated from Imperial College London in 1972 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. He formed Cherry Club Consultants Limited in 1990, which provides design services to help achieve compliance with EMC. This webinar is one of many Keith has done for Interference Technology. To view as others, visit interferencetechnology.com. This webinar will be interactive. You'll be able to ask questions, and we encourage you to participate. Take a look at your GoToWebinar navigation pane, the box on the right-hand corner of your screen. If at any time you have a question, we ask you to fill out the type box and hit send. To make the screen minimize and maximize, click the arrow button. To raise your hand to ask a question or report an issue, click the hand icon. We will present the topic for 35 minutes, followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. Now Keith will begin the presentation. Thanks, Belinda. Well, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the boot camp. You can see that you've seen the title here. But it's about uh, simulating um, circuits and why it's easy to um, uh, justify the cost, although they're going to be expensive. Okay, so let's, let's look at doing SI, that's signal integrity, PI, power integrity, and EMC, right first time. It's something computer motherboard manufacturers have been doing uh, for over 20 years. And they used originally computer-aided engineering tools that were developed for them that cost around about a million dollars per seat. Sounds expensive, especially since that was 20 years ago. But they didn't have a choice because the product sales life for a computer motherboard was about 90 days. So they, they had no um, time to fail any tests, any iterate any PCBs, or even have any uh, performance problems, not even once. The, the first board they made had to be the one that they saw, that they went into production with. So the computer aided engineering tools they used then are now much better, of course. They've been developed by a lot more, and they're much less expensive. Uh, still fairly expensive, uh, 250,000 US dollars, that sort of price, maybe 300,000, if you want the whole, the whole kit. But they're easy to justify financially, and this is because they can pay back on the first project or at least in the first year, which is really good value for any kind of financial investment. So let's see how they work, how this process works. <clears throat> first off, the circuit designer uses his SPICE or IBIS simulators to prove the initial schematic meets the signal integrity and power integrity targets and functions as specified. It's a functional spec. The main problem here is getting accurate uh, models of new ICs in time. The SPICE, the SPICE models are better, but um, you often don't get them very early on. So the circuit designer then netlists his completed schematic, which he simulated, remember, and proved that it works, to the board designer. And it also specifies to the board designer the electrical issues, which depend upon the board design. Things like criti critical component placements, noise margins, limits for crosstalk, limits for skew, and differential skew, and maximum propagation times, characteristic impedances for transmission lines, maybe maximum inductances, you know, that sort of thing. And they all have tolerances, of course. The board designer then does the initial board placement and layout, and uses his field solvers. He has, or should have, two-dimensional and three-dimensional field solvers to create simulation models of the structures, for instance, uh, connectors and large or tall components. And he chooses models for his components, uh, 
come to think of it, the models would probably be the same models that um, the circuit designer used. Um, active models, um, active components and passive components. And he'll choose models for any interconnecting cables uh, and connectors, which the, the board, the circuit designer, probably overlooked. Okay, here's some examples from ANSYS of um, simulating small structures like this RJ45 here, Ethernet connector, uh, some kind of structure on a printed circuit board here, again here, um, to extract the uh, field solving parameters for these various components. Here's some more examples of extracting various parameters. See, there's a big um, connector here. And the, the board designer then uh, inserts these models for the various connectors and things that he's got uh, into the board and extracts the critical board characteristics like resistance, inductive capacitance, propagation delay, ground bounds, uh, characteristic impedance, straight coupling, so on and so on. Now he'll do these, these are critical board characteristics, the ones that, that he knows he's got to look out for, either from his own um, experience or what the circuit designer has asked him to do. And here's the trick, he sends the characteristics back to the circuit designer for inclusion in the circuit simulation. It's a back feed from the PCB to the circuit simulation. So we often talk about these sorts of things as uh, we often describe as being strays or parasitics. And you may have heard them called the, the hidden schematic. Hmm? And it's the hidden schematic, the strays and parasitics in the board, you know, the inductance of a trace, this sort of thing, the crosstalk between traces, that causes signal integrity, such as crosstalk, distorted signals, noise, poor noise margins, poor signal-to-noise ratios, and power integrity and EMC problems. Okay. So here's the clever bit, because the circuit designer re-simulates the schematic using SPICE or IBIS with the critical hidden schematic board parameters included. Now, no human being could do this. If you took a, a PCB with, say, a circuit with 99 circuit nodes, that would be quite a small one, very small one in fact, 99 circuit nodes. And so maybe 100 traces on the board or something, a couple of planes, you know. If you extracted just to a first order approximation the hidden schematic for the whole board, you're looking at 99 factorial extra components. That's 99 times 98 times 97 times 96. That's a lot. And um, many of them will be unimportant, but some of them will be very important, and you not necessarily know what they are. If you drew 99 factorial hidden schematic components on your schematic, on a screen, the whole screen would just go black. You couldn't even read it. And that's just to a first order approximation. Now that'll get you to about, I'm, now, I'm guessing around 300 megahertz to a gig, somewhere in that region. If you want to simulate something uh, that's good to 5 or 10 gigs, you're going to need second or third order simulation. Say you're looking at 99 factorial squared or cubed or something like that. Just for your 99 node circuit board. It's very, very complex. Of course, computers can do this okay. They don't get uh, phased. It just takes them a little longer to crank through all, all the permutations. Anyway, the board designer simulates, re-simulates the schematic with the hidden schematic parameters extracted from the board layout and modifies the design to meet the specs. It is still a problem. It's any problem cause. The circuit designer then takes his second draft design, having fix the problems that he's found to the printed circuit board designer and maybe make some requests for changes in placement, routing and so on. Maybe some traces which are a bit long need to be made shorter or treated like transmission lines or whatever. And the board designer and the circuit designer go through these, this iterative procedure, iterati iterating the virtual design until they're both happy with the results. Let's look at an example. This is just an example of power integrity. Here you can see the um, spec for the impedance versus frequency for the power supply for a particular chip. Here it's been simulated 
and we found a couple of residences, well several residences, you can see one of them is over the line there, so that's bad, 750 megahertz. And we go through various analysis modes, and here's a clever bit, this is showing a, a plane layer in the board, it's all power planes. There's the DDR plane that we're investigating, and the, the uh, resonance is shown up as an animation. You can see how the, the plane is moved around vertically uh, in co corresponding to the amplitude of the voltage. So what actually is a very complicated issue becomes reduced to a very simple visual issue. Uh, we want to improve the design of this board so that when we simulate this plane, it doesn't flap about. As it flaps about, it changes color, as you can see. We might say, we don't want it to flap about any more than light green, like this little bit, little bit of light green appearing here. You know, we, we don't want to let it get into the uh, yellow, certainly not the red. Also, we can see this, this little DDR plane here. There's some DDR RAMs here, and there's a microprocessor that's connected to it. We can see where the resonance is happening physically which tells us you know, where to put our decoupling capacitors or otherwise improve the board. How, how possibly could you do that by building a board and testing it? You might discover that you've got a power supply resonance, although it's likely to show up as some incorrect uh, you know, memory data, fetch some memory, um, perhaps once an hour or something, so it's going to be a devil to track down because of the power integrity problem. Once we've solved that, once we've made that DDR plane um, not flap about, you can see there's various other bits that we have to go and deal with on the layer. Now, in 2007, that particular simulation that I've just shown you uh, took seven minutes on a good quality desktop PC. It took four iterations adding capacitor, re-simulating, adding capacitor, re-simulating, to, to get the DDR power plane uh, into spec uh, with no impedances more than 50% of the original spec. So there's the original spec. Um, there weren't any impedances any higher than about 60 dBs below that line. That takes 40 minutes overall. Um, Modern PCs, of course, are much more powerful than those that were available in 2007, and they cost less too, despite being more powerful. So how long would that take these days? I don't know. Probably it would take such a short time in the, in the computer simulation that the actual time spent for the person to think about it and press the buttons would be the dominant thing, maybe 10 minutes, perhaps. Like I said, there are other power plane resistances that remain to be fixed. And then, of course, there's other layers to simulate and fix. But if, if you're going to go through each layer in the circuit board and fix its um, resonances uh, in like half an hour per layer, if you have a 20-layer board, that's only 10 hours of work. So what's that, a day and a half? Or one day if you're feeling pretty keen. You know? Imagine trying to solve all those problems by building things and testing them and then modifying them and then testing them and then modifying them and testing them. Instead of a, like a day and a half, you'd be looking at more like a month and a half. So we aren't quite done yet because the, the designer, remember the board designer, simulated the critical areas of the component of the, of the circuit board. Now what he does is he runs a complete extraction of all the board characteristics, not just what he'd assumed were critical. It does a complete extraction. The circuit designer takes that complete extraction, puts it into his simulator, and, and simulates the operation of the circuit. Because it's always a problem. Um, we have, uh, you know, unknown unknowns. There are things which it's always the engineer's nightmare. How do we know to control the things that we don't know to look for? But with a, a complete simulation. Uh, it's now left nothing to chance. Obviously, a complete extraction uh, is a little more
Monte Carlo or similar analysis to, to find out whether the real life tolerances Uh, real life tolerances and variations like initial tolerances, aging, temperature coefficients and so on will still allow all the specifications to be met in volume manufacture and also to make sure that the board manufacturing tolerances which are required are within the capability of the chosen manufacturer. Maybe some modifications will be needed but we're still in the virtual world so we're modifying the virtual schematic, the virtual bill of materials and the virtual board layout. Take a, a PC with typical shielding and filtering. A motherboard designed like this can proceed directly to manufacture, knowing that all the technical specs for SI, PI and EMC will be met with a good yield in production. Notice we haven't built one physical prototype. As I say, the computer industry has been doing this um, since 1995. No pre-compliance testing, no design respins, no testing at all in fact. The first motherboard actually assembled is the first one that's sold to a customer. Or it could be. You might want to send it off for testing uh, because somebody wants to see a test report. But you know it's going to pass. So this virtual design process for two decades has been well proven to be 100% accurate for SI and PI, signal integrity and power integrity. But we don't have any tools yet precisely determining what you'll measure for EMC emissions immunity in a test lab when the final board is assembled in the final enclosure and connected to its cables. Tools are getting better all the time and the bit of EMC competence can be used to specify filters and shielding and so on. In fact, there's an almost perfect relationship between SI, PI and EMC. The cleaner and less distorted the waveforms for the signals and the power, the lower the emissions are, and vice versa. So for a modern PC motherboard, good EMC for digital and DC, DC converter circuits uh, can generally be achieved simply by setting five to ten times tougher limits for SI and PI that are needed to meet the functional specs. So um, where a, a power supply, for instance, wants, mm, I don't know, one milliohm, or let's say one milliohm to a gigahertz, you make it uh, yeah, 0.2 milliohms to three gigahertz or something like that. Where you've got 10%, where you can accept 10% overshoot on a digital signal, you select 2% or 1%. Here's an example of exactly this with a, a um, switching converter. This is from uh, Linear Technology. There's their old LT8610. has 2 nanoseconds rise time, 50% overshoot and 20 nanoseconds of ringing. Here's their so-called silent switcher, LT8614. has 2 nanosecond rise time, 10% overshoot and 10 nanoseconds of ringing. So its overshoot is 5 times less. Here linear type measured the emissions. I'm not sure how they measured them, it doesn't really say what the test method was, but you can see the 8610, there's the 8610 emissions line, there's the silent switch emissions line, and it varies, but in the middle here, if you like the average difference between the two uh, emission curves, is about 14 dBs, which is uh, almost exactly a fifth in other words, by reducing the overshoot height down by five times, we reduce the emissions by five times. A little note there about safety if you're measuring offline switches. So the digital circuits emissions of immunity are generally pretty closely related. So the frequencies at which we have high levels of emissions tend to be frequencies at which we're more susceptible. So for instance, passing, passing CISPR 22 class A emissions limits, you know, just about, typically means you're going to pass the immunity test at 3 volts per meter. Now, when I say typically, we're talking about plus minus 6 dBs or so. But anybody who um, wants to shave the margins you know, is going to need to do testing to make sure. Here we're trying to make 
to get to market quicker, which is um, more important than the bill of materials cost. Where you have uh, radiated or conducted immunity test levels higher than 3 volts per meter, maybe you're testing for the automotive environment at 30 volts per meter or 100 volts per meter, then for digital and DC-DC converter circuits, I would suggest that the emissions should be correspondingly lower. So, if you're going up from 3 volts per meter immunity to 30 volts per meter, I would suggest um, reducing your emissions by 20 dBs, from class A to a little bit less than class B, for instance. What about low frequency analog circuits? They don't have appreciable RF emissions, at least not when they're operating linearly. Watch out, though, for emissions at radio frequencies, if you overdrive them or cause them to clip or if they go unstable, then they can be quite nasty. But all low frequency analog circuits are susceptible to noise at over a gigahertz. I often have people say to me, oh, you know, I'm only using a, a one megahertz gain bandwidth op amp. They won't see any uh, RF, but that's not true because they, um, the, the one megahertz gain bandwidth or whatever it is, is a measure of its linear performance. And what we're talking about here is nonlinear performance, demodulation, intermodulation, all that sort of thing. And the tiny transistors in the op amps work beautifully well to several gigahertz. So they, all op amps will demodulate uh, noise at, at a gigahertz or more. So um, when we simulate the radio frequency resonances of our conductors and components, in the low-frequency analog area, we're actually simulating the behavior of the conductors and components as accidental antennas. In other words, how good are they? How good are they going to be at picking up noise from the environment and injecting them into the circuits? So this is a powerful technique for EMC design for low-frequency circuits. So another benefit of um, approaching EMC this way by uh, using better SI and PI specs is that it gives us the lowest overall cost of manufacture. It costs much less to achieve EMC, pass the EMC test, by spending more on the bill of materials and the printed circuit boards than by adding filtering and shielding after failing some tests. You're still going to need filtering and shielding, but with good SI and PI specs, it'll be less. It'll be smaller, it'll be lighter, It'll cost less money, it'll be easier. And the big thing is that it saves the project cost and time, the development cost and time. So our new products get to market more quickly. They, they quickly and easily meet the functional specs and reduce, and in the case of computer motherboards, eliminate a number of design respends. Now, what I meant to say there was, um, many of you will have managers, maybe you even are managers, who think that a bit of material cost is the important thing. It's not. Not since before 2000, in fact, about 15 years ago. Um, the thing that's most important for making profits, making money out of products these days, is the time to market. It's, it's worth spending more on the bill of material if it gets you to market quicker. If you're beating design engineers over the head with bomb costs, if you are a design engineer being beaten over the head by bomb costs, then uh, you're making a big mistake. You're actually not being as um, competitive as you can be with your company. Going back to this design, of course, uh, long power cables are going to need filtering and surge suppression. Signal cables are going to need filtering, shielding, ESD, surge suppression. Some, all, some or all broad areas might need board level shielding. But it's easy to make provision for these using proven good EMC design practices. As I said, ensure that every board's SI and PI is between five and ten times better than needed for functionality means you get a few, maybe even no, EMC surprises. For instance, from an unexpected resonance. It's usually the unexpected resonances that catches out. And our stimulation We'll find this. Here now, we have done an example from ANSYS. Here's an example from CST. There's lots of other simulator people out there. 
we're simulating that. Um, here you see, we, let's go back. We've got uh, a couple of ports, looks like a differential transmission line in the board. There's a couple of um, layer changes, layer changes here, layer changes there, ports here. Here you see we're simulating the, um, the input signal, the output signal, the near end crosstalk, the far end crosstalk. Um, a load of other things we're simulating here, return loss, insertion loss. Here it is being um, simulated, and we can see that the uh, high field strengths exist around the fire holes. Fire holes are, are notorious for causing problems for EMC and also for signal integrity and power integrity. There's other stuff going on here, but it's around these areas here and these areas here where we have the biggest problems that are causing the, the crosstalk and the uh, misshapen signals. Here's an example of a printed circuit board being simulated. And once again, um, we say, oh dear, you know, we've got some colors changing. We don't want colors to be changing because color changing indicates we've got fields leaking off the board, which is not what we want. So we improve the design. We approach each of these tracks. Maybe these traces are um, resonating because they've not been terminated properly or, or whatever. This one over here, see that one obviously needs a bit of, a bit of uh, tender loving care. That's going a bit a bit uh, a bit red at times. Some of these other ones, I mean this one over here, you, you might say, well that's that's acceptable, you know, we'll live with that. But certainly we don't want anything red or bright yellow. And can you imagine the trying to describe this, what we're saying here on the screen mathematically? Can you even begin to imagine it? Because I can't. But if you're trying to solve trying to design a thing using equations and textbooks and stuff like that. Um, it's very, very difficult even to do a tiny thing. Here, the simulator is just showing us by color changing that we need to do something. And we just do it until the color doesn't change anymore. It stays nice and blue in this case. Here's another simulation of a, a pulse uh, being propagating through something and producing an eye diagram. Here we can see the, the input signal and the uh, signal at the other end. Looks like we're getting some intersymbol interference creeping in there. And then this is another example from CST. What's this one simulating? It's getting, it's a, it looks like some kind of microwave circuit. I'm just simulating the waveform in um, 200 picoseconds per division here. So let's move on then to justifying the purchase of the simulators. Most companies are run for purely financial reasons these days. By people who aren't engineers, usually they're financial people, they don't understand what it is that we engineers actually do or how we do it. Now even if they were once engineers, Having moved into management, they'll probably be overwhelmed by financial issues and they won't anymore be up to date with design anyway. If we want to do our engineering for the best financial performance of our employers, who hopefully will reward us with nice salaries, we need to provide them with the information they need to manage us effectively. But of course, they don't understand engineering speak, they only understand finance speak, which we have to learn to communicate effectively with them. Yeah? There's no way they're ever going to understand our language, so we have to learn theirs. In fact, we only need to use the language of gambling. What's the prize value? What are the winnings, potentially? That would be the return on investment. How much is the stake? How much do we have to invest? What's the break-even point? What's that? That's when the investment and the interest on it, because you probably have to borrow the money, has been paid back. So everything else from then on is profit, it's gravy. What's the likelihood of success? So you see, it's just money, time and probability, that's all. 
money, time, and probability. We have to present these things in this order. Mm -hmm. We have to get our manager's attention by telling them the value of the prize. This is not the way engineers usually go about things. You, engineers usually spend half an hour or an hour explaining the problems and, and only at the end get on to what the solution is. And when anybody asks them, well, uh, how much is that worth? How much is going to benefit us? They haven't thought about that at all. But the financial people go about it the other way. So we have to do that the other way. Otherwise, you'll get nowhere. We have to limit our communication with the managers to issues of money, always stating the prize value first, time and probability. And if we, if we have to use any, talk about any engineering issues, we have to summarize them in plain, normal, everyday language. We mustn't use any technical terms, mathematics, acronyms, CISPA, for instance, no jargon, ring back, for instance, no standards numbers, at all, none whatsoever. It's very important. Just talk about money, time, and probability. So, in fact, we're making a business case. But to be able to do this, we have to assess all the relevant issues for the entire organization. And we have to cost them. Now, costing them to within 30% accuracy is usually uh, impossible. Plus minus 25%, plus minus 30%. It's often as good as you can get. And most engineers are uncomfortable with this. You can't calculate it to five significant figures. It does mean we move outside our comfort zone, the stuff we studied, and it does mean making imprecise estimates. Yes, yes, it's a cruel hard world. Tough, okay? Get over it. Because for people who are prepared to, to do this, there's uh, huge rewards available. The engineer, who's reasonably competent, but who can speak the manager's language. Yeah, that's a, an important creature, an important person in the company, and will go very far. Now, our managers are going to take our ideas and present them as if they're their own ideas. We mustn't mind this. They want to make themselves look good in front of their peer group, which is other managers, and their bosses, but we mustn't mind them doing this, okay? Remember, we're getting what we need to make the, the organization more successful. If, if people want to pretend that it was all their idea, well, let them get on with it. The thing is, we're getting what we need. We're getting what we want. And anyway, these people will always remember who it was that made them look good. So you could sum, sum this up as, as uh, our job as engineers is to make our managers look good. And some people have a problem with that. Once again, I say, get over it. Hmm? Otherwise, you're getting in the way of your own success. This is just what people do. Don't worry about it. Now, of course, what we're really talking about is, is reducing financial risk. The uncertainty, for instance, in the time it'll take to successfully bring a new product to market. We have to bear in mind that, that there's a lot more investment goes into new products than just our cost of our salaries. And uh, a lot of engineers don't realize how much it costs. Let's look at the simulator. Say it was simulator was $250,000. And we have to be trained on it and use it fully. This could easily save a month's time to market. And I'm deliberately being uh, conservative here. It's, in most companies, it might save two, three, four, five months, maybe even a year. Let's say it'll save a month's time to market with a 50-50 probability. Hmm? If you ask your marketing boss, the VP of marketing or the director of marketing, whatever, how much getting to market a month earlier is worth, he might say it's a million dollars. I've worked on projects where that was the case, and they weren't very big projects. Okay, so we invest a million, we invest a quarter of a million dollars, and during the life of this next project, we'll get to market uh, a month earlier and make a million dollars. This is what they call in the financial world a no-brainer. Hmm? It's a no-brainer. There's always money available for investment in something like this. Even if managers tell, you, tell us that there's no money available, 
All it means is we're not making a good enough business case. There's always money available if you have um, a good proposition, a good gambling proposition. Of course, we have to make our proposal in the right way. I've told you how to do it. In fact, most financial managers would be totally appalled by the risks, the financial risks their companies are being unwittingly exposed to by engineering decisions that we engineers take all on our own. We don't discuss them with them, with our managers, because we can't. So we, you know, put a finger in the air, flip a coin, whatever, make a decision, and, and we just go ahead and do it. They don't know we're making these decisions. Uh, if they did, uh, they, they would never sleep again, to be honest. I sincerely believe my experience uh, over, how long is it now I've been in the business? 40, 45 years in the electronics business. And the thing that holds most companies back, and I've seen hundreds of companies, is effective communication between engineers and managers. There's a, an awful lot of low-hanging fruit in most organizations, just things which are just you know, easy, quick things it just requires a little bit of effective communication and understanding. But it means that we engineers have to learn to speak to our managers in the, in the language that they understand. That's why justifying the project to the simulator is, that, is actually so easy once you step outside the pure engineering world. So the intelligent use of policy simulators will soon make all the difference between companies bringing ever more complex electronics to market on time without most being returned under warranty or alienating their market with high costs, poor, poor, poor performance, too many bug fixes, and the difference between companies who are sliding towards oblivion because their engineers can't effectively communicate what they need to their managers. And that's the end of my presentation. Great. Over to you, Belinda. Thank you so much, Keith. We would like to have a call for final questions from the audience. Please enter any last questions you may have in the navigation pane. We have received quite a few questions on where to get additional information on this topic. There's a vast amount of content on emclive2015.com and interferencetechnology.com and Keith's website, cherryclough.com. You can also email us at info at interferencetechnology.com with specific needs and we can direct you accordingly. Keith, here's a question for you. I don't understand why you say there is a relationship between SI and EMC. Uh, well, yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. And um, it's something I learned sort of by accident, really. So here's a few slides. Okay. Um, let's look at a 16 megahertz square wave. Now, I made this slide a long time ago when 16 megahertz was, you know, a reasonably fast clock frequency. We can just multiply everything by 10 if you want to have 160 megahertz. Anyway, here's our um, uh, 60 megahertz square wave, pure square wave, two nanosecond of full times. There's the envelope of the thirds and fifths and sevenths and so on. That's the classical envelope of a square wave, Fourier transform of a square wave. There's a corner frequency here where it starts going off at a faster rate because of the rise time. Okay, So this is 20 dBs per decade and that's 40 dBs per decade. But notice even our 16 megahertz square wave has energy uh, up at several hundred megahertz. If, which is more like the modern world, if we had a rise time of 0.2, sorry, 0.5 nanoseconds instead, then that envelope extends to there. I notice that up in this region about a gigahertz, we've got about 20 dBs more energy in that spectrum there. This is a typical switching speed of, of ordinary glue logic, HCMOS glue logic these days. In fact, that might even be a little bit slow. Okay. Now then, here's a, an example of a 200 millimeter long printed circuit board trace um, with various assumptions. It's FR4, no, no plane, low impedance drop, high impedance load. It's an idealized analysis. And it's the accidental behavior, accidental antenna behavior of a trace, okay, on its own. Here's its antenna efficiency in dBs, 
and you see it's a wonderful antenna at a quarter wavelength, three quarters, five quarters, and so on. Okay, that's a 60 B per octave region, there's a resonant region. Now let's take that waveform and stick it down this trace and see what comes out at the end. There's the original signal waveform. That's drawn to scale, actually, for 16 megahertz with 2 nanosecond rise in the full time. That's the final waveform at the end of the trace. Does that look familiar? Ringing and overshoot? Slower rise time? Now, if this is in an EMC chamber and you put an antenna in the chamber and you connect it to an oscilloscope instead of a spectrum analyzer, what you'll see is this. Our square wave has been converted into a Fourier transform, if you like. Some of the frequencies have radiated off that antenna. Didn't make it to the end because they radiated off at these particular frequencies along the way. Didn't make it to the end. When we take the, the um, frequencies we have left at the end and do a reverse Fourier transform, we end up with this waveform here. Miss, it's missing these bits because these bits have all been radiated into the air. With the proper scaling, you can uh, do an A plus B and end up with the original waveform. Now, obviously, there, there's some little bits of energy get absorbed in exciting resonant molecules in the PVC and the FR4, but they're surprisingly few. Most of it, the fact that we see that waveform instead of a square wave tells us we've got radiated emissions. So, when you have a rectangular waveform which has overshoot and ringing, it's losing some of its energy into the air. The traces or the wires are behaving like accidental antennas, which are quite efficient at certain frequencies. So we can easily find out what the worst noise frequencies are by looking at the frequency of the ringing seal on the oscilloscope. That example I had before was a bit simple. Often you've got two or three ringing frequencies all at once. It means a circuit that has excellent signal integrity, in other words, low or no overshoot or ringing, has good EMC, and using good EMC design techniques from the start for a project achieves excellent signal integrity because EMC is harder. Now, my presentation a few minutes ago uh, did it the other way around. It was designing using a simulator to have excellent signal integrity and the EMC was going to be good as a result. Anyway, um, I hope that's uh, helped. Back to you, Belinda. Great. Here's another question. My manager tells me we have no money available for purchasing anything, so he just won't listen if I try to explain why we need to buy a simulator. Well, you're not, uh, you're not talking to him correctly. I've seen, I've seen senior engineers reduced to tears by trying to explain things to their managers because they couldn't talk in a language a manager understood at all. You've got to do it the way I said. You've got to figure out for yourself, in your own time if necessary, what the benefits are, what the winnings are, and go back to the, um, and go to your manager and, and say that first. You might say it over coffee. You might say, for instance, um, I know somebody who spent 100,000, 150,000 pounds, British pounds, improving the design of their product. And uh, in their first year, they saved 2.7 million pounds on warranty returns. Okay? Now imagine you go to your manager and say, um, I'd like to spend 100,000 pounds on, and that's as far as you get. What does he say? There's no money. I wish you engineers would stop coming asking to spend money. We have no money. We spent it all, you know. You've got to make do with what you've got. You don't even get a chance to explain that there's some big winnings to be had there. Now imagine you're uh, at the coffee machine and your manager's there, you know, and you say, he says, how are you? You say, oh, mm, you know, I, I've been thinking. I think we could save £2.7 million pounds a year on warranty returns. Oh, you know, he'll say, well, how much is that going to cost? Oh, about 100,000, 150,000. They put it that way around, you've got his attention. It's all about how you do it, but you have to do your homework first. Hmm? You, know, you don't just dream up figures, they've got to be reasonably plausible figures. 
that 2.7 million might be plus or minus 50 percent it might take you uh, you know might take you a year might take you two years whatever but those are good odds if you can win if you stand a chance of winning two and a half million by investing 150,000 you know with a 50 percent probability as a gamble and all companies are run by gamblers that's what that's what investment and you know profits is all about is gambling uh, as a gamble that's a no-brainer so uh, just do the things the way, the way I said it's proven to work okay great thank you so much Keith we have received so many great questions we will try to address in the future Keith thank you again for your time and expertise Please join us for EMC Live 2015, a three-day event which takes place April 28th to 30th. Webinar attendees, if you have any more questions, please send us an email at info at interferencetechnology.com. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website, emclive2015.com. We will also send a link to all participants shortly. Thank you for attending.